Our watches are smart, so are our cars, and our phones have been for a while. But clothes? Can clothes really be that smart? Smart clothes are items that have been enhanced with technology to add functionality beyond traditional uses, and they are becoming much more common. Some smart clothes feature advanced textiles with interwoven circuitry, while others implement sensors and additional hardware to give it high-tech functionality. While integration with your iPhone or Android could be considered a frivolous function, researchers and startups are developing smart clothes with important applications in healthcare, the military, and high-performance athletics. Today, we're joined by Asamina Querti, Assistant Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at The Ohio State University and an expert in bioelectromagnetics. She's one of the researchers pushing boundaries in the emerging field of smart clothes and fabrics. Welcome. I'm Ayana Howard, Dean of Engineering at The Ohio State University, and this is Ingenuity. Assistant Professor Asamita Korti, her transformational research in wearable and implantable sensor technology will undoubtedly lead to improvements in health outcomes and the lives of others. She has earned widespread recognition for her work, including a prestigious early career award and 40 under 40 honors from Columbus Business First. Her publication record? It includes over 170 peer-reviewed publications. A native of Greece, her efforts outside the lab and the classroom are equally impressive. And a special note is her creativity in developing the Techno Fashion Workshop, which she successfully grew into a year-long program to inspire and sustain enthusiasm for STEM with the focus of middle school girls. Asamina, thank you for joining us. Many thanks for the invitation. Glad to be here today. Beautiful. So I love fashion, um, and I obviously love technology. So I am fascinated by the concept of smart clothes. So what about you? I mean, how did you become interested in developing technology that you can wear? So that's kind of a long story. Uh, I'm going to go back to how it all started. Um, when I was 18 years old, I honestly didn't really know what I want to do in the future. I love math. I love STEM. Uh, I'm like, I'm going to sign up for engineering, electrical and computer engineering. Our studies back in Greece are five years long. so. I'll explore different courses and decide what I want to do. Over the course of those five years, uh, I realized I love electromagnetics and the whole concept of wireless communication, sending out information out of thin air, basically. Um, and moving on to my master's studies, uh, I explored the field of medicine and kind of combining now electromagnetics with medicine, transmitting wireless information through our body. Uh, later on, during my PhD years, later my postdoc, Kind of my vision, I started like in academia, right? And my vision is to think ahead 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road. Uh, when I say future, I don't wanna see how things are gonna evolve in two or three years, but much but further away than that. Uh, I started thinking about smartphones. Uh, back in the 70s, we had our first cell phone, which was like a foot long. Uh, I could probably make one call and you had to charge for hours. And here we are today with our smartphones. And 20 years down the road, I'm sure smartphones are going to look different. So I thought the same about clothing. I'm like, our clothing looks the same for thousands and thousands of years. Um, is it going to look the same forever? Probably not. So then I started bridging all these disciplines, electromagnetics, which was my first passion, then medical applications, and then eventually clothing. And here we are today. So you mentioned medicine, and most people understand medicine. But you use this word electromagnetics and bioelectromagnetics, and I'm sure many in our audience are like, I'm not quite sure what that is. So I, I wanna have you explain, I mean, what does that actually mean? Yeah, so what I really love about electromagnetics is that the term is technical, and you're right, like what does that mean? But we are using electromagnetics on our daily lives. That's how cell phones communicate wirelessly, anything wireless around us, like microwave ovens, uh, like I said, cell phones, our smart watches, Anything wireless, uh, Wi-Fi, relies on electromagnetics. The idea is that current generates magnetic fields, charges generate electric fields. And these fields can propagate in free space. They do not require any medium. 
So that enables us uh, to facilitate wireless communications. Uh, merging that now with biomedical applications, you can have all these wearable devices or wireless implants, where you do not need a wire, you do not need a cable to sustain the communication. It can happen through air. So even though I may not know how to even spell electromagnetics, I do now know that it's around us every day. Mm -hmm. That's um, correct. I like this. Okay, so you mentioned you know this aspect of implantable and biomedical applications, and so I'm a big fan of, of convergent research, especially when you look at engineering intersecting with medicine. I'm um, especially here at Ohio State. So I want a little I probe because you mentioned bio a couple of times. Are you collaborating with medical researchers on campus, or is this just kind of like the future? No, that's right. Like our research very strongly relies on interdisciplinary collaboration, and I would say it works in two different ways. There are cases where we come up with an idea by we, I mean, we as engineers in my group, and then we reach out to the College of Medicine or nursing or veterinary medicine and say, hey, we have this idea. Do you think you have an application for it? Or it works the other way around. Uh, clinicians reach out to us and they say, hey, we have a huge need in that area. Do you think you can develop something for us? Uh, so I'm gonna bring up like two examples just for each of these two cases. Uh, we started developing wearable sensors, uh, integrating clothing that can monitor kinematics or motion of the human body out in uh, the real world. So like, okay, now we have these clothes that can monitor our joint movement and whether our, our knee is like 30 degrees or 50 degrees uh, of flexion. Why would we need that? We reached out to sports medicine, we reached out to the School of uh, Rehabilitation Sciences. They came up with ideas like people having undergone ACL reconstruction or people having concussion and how there is huge interest in monitoring their kinematics outside of the lab. Now the other way around, um, I got a call a few years back from the College of Nursing and they say we need a way to monitor baby's height or length because they're lying down, they call it length. And apparently there's no technology to do that other than taking two plastic pieces, aligning them on the head and on the feet and squeezing the baby to just measure the length. So then we worked with them and developed a um, mat or smart baby bedding to monitor their length uh, inconspicuously and on a 24 seven basis. So, you know, I'm into the pediatrics, but you know, I'm gonna, for our older population, do you do anything in older adults, Parkinson's and in, in that domain? So uh, actually this technology that I just mentioned can be expanded to other populations too. Uh, so we started with length or height uh, or at the stage we're, we're expanding upon this idea. Uh, one is people or elderly who are unfortunately like stuck in a bed uh, or hospitalized and you want to monitor like the position of the human body. Uh, we're developing games uh, for kids with disabilities that can also expand to older populations, uh, people with Alzheimer's uh, probably, like cooperative or collaborative games. Um, and, and we're always open to ideas, like I said, from different colleges to develop, um, you know, technologies for them. So I love this fact of, you know, I think a lot of people think of engineers as siloed, like, oh, those engineers, they're over in the lab, they never talk to us. And here, I, I love the, this concept of you reaching out and saying, look, I want to collaborate this is what I can offer. I just love that, that convergence of ideas. Yeah, I need to say that the dynamics are interesting. It was not easy getting started um, in the sense that we as engineers develop our own sensors. Uh, at least in my group, we develop sensors from scratch. Like we're not buying off the shelf components to put them together. We're really designing from scratch. And oftentimes clinicians think that we have the sensor up and running and ready to test. So I had to find that sweet spot of how we market and describe what we're doing for them and I think our comfort level now is high and yeah it's awesome being at Ohio State and having the ability to work with them. So you're also a translator of engineering language to others. I am and also an educator on one of my students, my PhD students who also have to talk and collaborate with them and I've trained them before they reach out. Okay so I'm going to change the subject a little bit because it's and well it's really about this engineering language. Um, so if you think about reaching out beyond uh, engineering, but even beyond Ohio State. You know, one of the things I've learned about Columbus is that it is an up and coming fashion industry leader, which I didn't actually know. Um, I mean, there's several corporate headquarters located here. And I mean, corporate headquarters from places that I shop. So I was kind of pleased. And so when you think about corporate engagement and the fashion, and you talked about the wearables, 
are you interested in partnering with these companies to kind of help them think about this wearable smart clothing space? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Yeah, thanks for bringing it up. Uh, let me start by saying that commercialization and entrepreneurship is something that I am interested in. Uh, I'm a REACH alumni. REACH is an Ohio State program um, for inspiring women uh, to pursue their entrepreneurial um, efforts and dreams. Um, and I have worked with industry in general uh, as part of like STTR, SBIR programs, uh, and so on. Now, back to Columbus. Uh, I didn't know either when I first came here. Uh, but over the course of time, I was approached by different like small businesses and larger industries working in the in fashion in general, and I was surprised to see that they're like really interested about incorporating technology. Um, and more recently, I came aware of this uh, Columbus Fashion Alliance, uh, which is a new effort, um, probably two years now or so. It's a an alliance, like I said, of people related to fashion from different perspectives, from like just the fabric itself to Internet of Things, uh, to manufacturing and so on. And when I heard about them, I reached out and I'm like, hey, are you interested in like smart clothing or is it just fashion, you know, for the sake of fashion? They're like super interested. So I have interacted with them a lot over the past couple of years. And I got to know many people working in the fashion industry, uh, kind of presenting my research, learning about them. So I think there are like so many opportunities looking ahead. Beautiful. So, you know, for those of you who are out there listening, uh, PR plug, uh, engineers will work with companies. See, and here's an example. Correct. Um, so you just mentioned the future and you thought about, you know, you're reaching out, uh, innovation and fashion, and these are kind of longer term objectives. And so if you think about, you know, the future and if you had this crystal ball, how widespread do you think smart clothes and wearable technology will be in? Let's just choose five years. Yeah, so this is something I keep thinking about. Um, you know how research works when we get funding for our students. So then I have to think like five years ahead or 10 years ahead. So I have kind of two answers, which I guess this is what's going on in my head. I think one is the short term version of things. So like you said, what's gonna happen kind of in five years? And for that, there are statistics out there saying that we're expecting uh, the wearables market to double or triple probably within the next five years. But then I'm kind of thinking, so what's missing? What else can be done to further grow this industry? And my take at least on that is that as of now, wearables are used for fitness, uh, fun, sports applications. There, there's no such thing as a medical wearable, something that we would rely on for like healthcare applications. Like we have the smartwatches, we have these like Fitbit-like devices, all of them have a warning that this should not be used for medical purposes. And there are lots of reasons, one of them being reliability of the devices. So my take is that the major market is medicine and healthcare, and as we keep working um, in this area, expanding upon the capabilities, making them more reliable, there will be a point probably not in the next five years, but I think it's coming up, where these devices will be reliable enough to be employed in medical settings. And I think that's when it's, wearables are really gonna grow exponentially. Okay, so medical wearables, you heard it here. So when this becomes a full-blown industry, it started at Ohio State. <laughs> so um, you had talked about uh, earlier, I mentioned this program called Techno Fashion. Um, and it's a workshop which engages uh, young girls in, in terms of STEM. So I just want you to tell us a little bit about it and even what motivated you to launch it. Yeah, so I'll start with the latter question, the motivation. Um, so I think it was back in 2018. Uh, so overall, over the course of years, I have been invited to several like outreach and STEM events, mainly because, like I said, electromagnetics is, yeah, uh, technical jargon, but it's all around us. So people tend to invite us in like museums and libraries to talk about this technology and wearables and so on. And there is always this concern about an increasing the number of women and girls in engineering. And I guess I'm thinking about it, like why, like what's missing? And 2018 or so, I came across this report. Um, they had interviewed or quizzed 100,000 girls, if I remember correctly, um, in school age girls about like 
if they, whether they want to pursue STEM careers or what's missing and so on. And the statistics were like, to me at least, uh, surprising. So if I remember correctly, they said more than 70% of the girls are actually interested in STEM and they are good at STEM. But one third only thinks that they can pursue that. Meaning that it's not like they're not good at math or they do not like math. It's because they don't have confidence in themselves. And then I'm like, so at what stage that, does that happen and why? And again, based on that same report, it's during the middle school years where this confidence really plummets. So that kind of triggered an idea of starting a new workshop focused on middle school girls where it introduced the STEM concepts and kind of try and boost their confidence in making it happen, saying like, I can do it. Uh, so it started as a very small workshop. It was like a three hour workshop. We organized my PhD students. We got a very small funding, like 2K from IEEE for that. And the idea is to bring girls to the electroscience lab and have them build a plush toy where they made some like LEDs and they embroidered circuits um, based on their own imagination and design. It went really well. Um, kids enjoyed it. And at the end, we asked for feedback. So everything was great. Parents loved it, girls loved it. But there is one concern, that there's no continuity. They're like, we spent a wonderful Saturday morning, but that's it, now what? So that got us thinking. Um, I, by, by the way, I did partner with Cool Tech Girls, a local um, nonprofit here in Columbus, to recruit the girls. And I started talking to Cool Tech Girls about an idea that would secure continuity. And that's how we came up with this year-long experience now called Techno Fashion, which is a series of eight workshops spread throughout the course of a year. And at the end, there is a design challenge for the girls. So now throughout the year, they learn about circuits, they learn about programming, uh, they come up with design projects on their own, they're being mentored, uh, they get to meet some role models, uh, interact, ask questions, and so on. Uh, we have run this year-long workshop twice so far. Uh, we had challenges due to COVID, uh, so we're envisioning something that will be in person, but it had to be remote, but we're building on it, uh, trying to get like more funding, hopefully, and uh, ideally even go beyond Columbus and make it more of a national, maybe international, who knows, uh, level of program. Very nice, it's called techno fashion. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. So, um, you know, we talked about bioelectromagnetics and wearables and, of course, the techno fashion. You know, I often say that engineering is everywhere. But I have to admit that clothes doesn't immediately come to mind when I said that before. But I will tell you, that changed today. And I really can't wait to see. And of course, wear. I'm going to be your first customer of Professor Corti's innovations in the not-so-distant future. I appreciate her joining us today for another episode of Ingenuity. If you like what you heard and are interested in learning more, are suggesting your own topics for the podcast, be sure to connect with us on Twitter or Facebook at OSU Engineering. Thanks for listening.